Thank you, Beatrice, and uh, greetings from uh, snowy and cold uh, Finland in Helsinki. Um, could we put the uh, presentation through to the next slide, please? Yeah, okay. So um, basically, uh, just to introduce the topic, um, you can think of the issues in this way that we have kind of, you know, coins are two sided uh, and really um, the uh, transition to net zero or the low carbon future, whatever you wish to call it, is um, a two sided coin, at least for the country's concern. So, you know, if, if we look at the producers of, um, of oil, gas and uh, minerals, uh, you know, we have one category of fossil fuel producers producing the oil and the gas and the coal. Uh, and then we have another group of countries who are, um, who are metal producers producing the, the copper, the nickel, the, um, the more exotic uh, minerals, the cobalt and the lithium, which are increasing demand. So uh, we have kind of uh, two sides of this, uh, of this coin of uh, low carbon transition. Now, of course, you know, some countries this is a simplification because some countries are obviously, um, they possess uh, considerable resources on both sides. So, you know, for example, if you take the case of example of, um, of Ghana, it's a, an oil and gas producer, but it also, also has quite a few uh, metals which are useful for the low carbon future. Um, similarly, um, uh, some of the other economies in, in Africa. But, but some countries are, are fairly exclusively fossil fuel producers, you think of the um, obvious countries in the Middle East, but uh, and some countries are most obviously metals producers. You think of Zambia, where um, which produces um, primarily copper. So how is this going to play out? So, so if we think about the fossil fuel producers, um, and basically we're going to have a story where um, coal, the use of coal is going to be stranded first. We're, we're still using too much coal in the global energy system but we can expect some phase out of coal. So, you know, a lot of coal is, is simply gonna remain ultimately in the ground. Um, coal is increasingly replaced by gas in energy generation. Gas has um, about half the emissions, but it's still uh, associated with, with climate emissions, including um, methane. So eventually in a few decades, we'll see the phase out of gas as wind and solar take over. And of course, then we have oil, and oil is used in aviation fuel, and there's no great substitute for that at the moment. And of course, in uh, propelling vehicles. But again, you know, the electric vehicle revolution uh, will slowly uh, move uh, petrol driven vehicles out of the systems. So for fossil fuel producers, uh, you know, we see a, a, a transition in the markets, which, which are really quite profound. And many of them have actually built up their development trajectories um, on dependence on the revenues, uh, the fiscal revenues, the public revenues from uh, fossil fuel exports and also their foreign exchange and so forth. Um, so for the fossil fuel producers, what we're going to see is that their public finances um, are going to be under um, pressure. Uh, to a degree, there's going to be a squeeze on the uh, tax and other revenues they get um, from uh, companies or for example, in the case of a national oil company from the national oil company. Uh, we've already seen as it were a, a, a kind of precursor of this, uh, this year, the oil price, uh, the international oil price collapsed below um, $30. It's uh, now back up to $60, but um, you know, about uh, seven years ago, it was around about $130. So, you know, a lot of countries that made an assumption about the oil price are, are receiving um, very bad, uh, very bad news on their public revenues, and of course that will affect their development spending, their ability to spend on uh, social uh, policy and education, and so forth. Where the oil price goes in the future, well, you know, your guess is as good as mine, and something we could come back to in debate. Um, to a degree, the gas producers, as I said, are in a somewhat better position. Uh, there's a ready market for gas in Asia as, as Asia increasingly switches over for coal. The, the only sort of big problem there is prices are quite low and gas is, is quite an oversupplied resource. Plus some of the new producers, for example, uh, Mozambique, have actually gone out and borrowed quite heavily 
on their prospective gas revenues without really having any money in the bank yet. So there's been debt accumulation. And you know, people will be familiar with what we call the resource curse. But in some ways, there's a pre-resource curse, which is you attempt to spend the money uh, before you've actually received it. Now, you know, as, as stranding takes place in the market, as uh, the uh, demand for fossil fuels diminishes, so it's going to be the lowest cost producers that have the advantage. Uh, those lowest cost producers who produce at volume are mostly in the Gulf region and the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and so forth. That's going to be quite hard times, probably for the African producers, uh, for example, Angola, because they produce offshore uh, deep water oil and so forth, which is you know, really quite expensive to extract. I've already mentioned the debt issue. We could come back to that in discussion. That's really quite a, a problem. The other issue affecting the fossil fuel producers, of course, is that many of their own electricity uh, systems are dependent on fossil fuels. And indeed, um, some of the um, uh, systems have built up extremely large uh, uh, losses and debts. Uh, so you think of uh, South Africa and ESCOM, which is very coal dependent. Um, and then to a degree, that's actually um, acting as a disincentive in their adoption of renewables. Uh, wind and solar because they have these incumbent suppliers of electricity which are dependent on the use of fossil fuels. The national oil companies are quite vulnerable. Uh, they're also uh, very debt laden and uh, there could be a reluctance and this is something we should really talk about. Will some of the um, fossil fuel producers be really very reluctant going forward to implement the global climate goals of the Paris Agreement because you know, they're seeing their budget stretched and uh, what are they going to do as an alternative? So that's the fossil fuel producers. Just turning quickly to the other side of the coin, the metals producers. Well, again, we have a, a public finances issue. Uh, in some ways, some of them could actually see a boom in uh, public revenues, um, uh, particularly the producers of the, uh, the cobalt and the lithium. Uh, if you're uh, producing uh, cobalt, then uh, Tesla will beat a, a path to your door because it needs uh, extremely large amounts of uh, cobalt and lithium for the batteries, similarly nickel and so forth. But metals, metals, uh, it's, a, it's a really kind of boom and bust cycle. One of the um, uh, interesting things about the pandemic is, is actually um, metals prices, many, in many cases, are, are higher than before the pandemic because the market is looking forward to increasing demand. How the mineral producers, the metals producers manage those public revenues is going to be a big issue because, of course, there's plenty of uh, unfortunate experiences in the areas of extractives where countries have mismanaged their revenue booms. So, you know, public revenues, you can have a problem with um, insufficient public revenues, but sometimes you can have a problem with too much revenue too quickly, and then you're tempted to blow the money on all kinds of um, ill-designed projects and expenditures. Uh, there's obviously big issues around transparency, uh, the management of investment flows into mining, um, and uh, actually some of the countries do have uh, very high debt. I mentioned the case of, of Zambia before. Uh, Zambia, you know, the copper revenues are doing well, but Zambia has accumulated very, very large um, sovereign debt. So quite a high proportion of those extra revenues are simply going to go into more debt service. Finally, I'd just like to finish on a, a few points. When, when we look at the, the mining industry, we have to understand that the mining industry is changing quite rapidly. Uh, automation is moving ahead at a very fast pace. It's becoming a very high tech game. Uh, there will be new forms of mining, including sea mining, which are opened up for new technologies. That could have all kinds of unfortunate environmental effects if it's not, uh, if it's not uh, well managed. Uh, automation will also reduce the demand for labor uh, in some uh, countries and will affect the social license to operate uh, because communities will see less employment as mines become more, uh, more um, automated. And there are also issues around artisanal and small scale uh, mining as well and the regulation of that. So the big question about the mining industry as it, uh, as it uh, expands to um, provide mine, uh, minerals for the low carbon revolution is, is how are we going to uh, get more development and poverty benefit from the, um, from the extractive industries? How are you going to cut emissions 
and the social harm that's often associated with mining and uh, how we can all monitor the global value chain in mining uh, going forward. So a massive number of exciting and interesting issues that cover both development, uh, they cover environment, they cover climate change, and they cover the geopolitics of where we are coming out of the um, pandemic. So thank you very much.